I'm Christy Ballantyne, and I have the pleasure of going over what we talked about this morning at the FDA update and late-breaking trials. Uh, joined by my colleagues, if you all will introduce yourself, and we're going to get into some of the highlights of the, of the morning. Hi, I'm Bob Echo. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Carter Medal Valley Health Congress, so it's good to be with you today. Yes, Deepak Bhatt, also a longtime member of the faculty here at CMHC. Great to be here live in Boston. Keith C. Ferdinand from New Orleans. My pleasure. George Backris uh, from the University of Chicago, also a member of the CMHC panel. So a lot going on uh, and a lot of exciting things. Start off kind of in the area where the issue of uh, hypertension, the kidney, heart failure, uh, that's been a big, tremendous amount of progress, and I think putting things back into focus, Keith, in terms of, you know, something that was neglected a bit. You want to start off with some of the, your thoughts? Yeah, I spoke to that. There's been progress, but if you look at some of the latest data, probably related to the pandemic, but also related to a lack of public health focus on hypertension, control rates are going down. And I think it's very predictive for a wide range of cardiovascular conditions. If we don't control blood pressure, we're going to be in trouble. Well, we've got some progress, particularly heart failure. You hit over another... Oh, that's real progress. Yeah, yeah the SGLT2 inhibitors now have been shown to be effective for reducing cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization across a wide range of ejection fractions. We already had data with and with the Impareg related to Impreserve. And now we have dapagliflozin, they had DAPA-HF reduced, and now they have delivered, which show they're preserved. So you can go from the ejection fraction 15 up to 60%, there clears to be a, a benefit with the SGLT2 inhibitor. So that's, oh, that's great news. Actually, soda too, right, Deepak? I oh, mean, absolutely. Yeah. Actually, dapagliflozin in the SOLAS trial, we were the yeah. first to show a benefit in heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction of all the SGLT2. But it's not yet FDA approved, is it? No, it's with the FDA. We've got to see what they say. But I think at least some of the lessons really were an early signal of a class effect with respect to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and benefit across the full range of GFR and full range of protein. So oh, yeah. it's extraordinary because, you know, we've always had this cardiorenal axis, hypertension, renal disease, heart failure. But what about the kidney, George? I mean, that's equally exciting, right? What's so, going on there? So, uh, first of all, the kidney is officially a cardiovascular risk factor. And uh, I think it's important for cardiologists to understand this concept because it's a alive and well, and the data is overwhelming for 20 years now. So you need to preserve kidney function, not just the heart. Number one. Number two, the data is very clear, and in fact, we've now got unified guidelines between the American Diabetes Association and KDGO, which is an international guidelines source, really putting together a plan in the patient with diabetes to make sure that you're optimizing care, not just for blood pressure and not just for the kidney, but also for diabetes. And it turns out SGLT2s, that you were just talking about, along with the standards that you'd expect, blockers of the renin angiotensin system in maximal doses, and now with the new agent, fen uh, fenerinone, uh, clearly all, not only slow progression of kidney disease, but also reduce heart failure hospitalizations. So this is really a, a new major finding that has now afforded us three pillars of therapy for preserving kidney function, buying into the pillars of therapy for heart failure. But George, you know, finerenone really doesn't lower blood pressure that much, does it? So it's interesting, interesting. I'm glad you asked me that question. Finerenone actually does lower blood pressure if your blood pressure is high. It's in hypertension, in press right now, and it also lowers, converts people to dipping status from non-dipping status, also in the Journal of Hypertension. So. There, there's, there's stuff that's unappreciated. If you're normal tensive, it won't lower it. But by the way, spiral won't either. You know, a corollary of that, if you look at the SGLT2 inhibitors, which were first considered anti-diabetic medicines, they did not have much of a blood pressure effect. And in the heart failure studies, there's not much of a blood pressure effect. But I looked at 150 self-identified African Americans with a mean blood pressure of 158, 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure, we dropped it 10 points placebo subtracted 8.5, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. 
So the higher the blood pressure, this kind of goes to what George was saying, the higher the blood pressure, the higher will be the blood pressure lowering with any particular agent. In this particular case, SGLT2 inhibitors, where the hypertensive effect may be under-recognized based on the diabetes and the heart failure studies. But the heart failure benefit in finerenone does not necessarily relate to the blood pressure. Totally yes. has nothing to do with it. No. Areas that we had not been able to do much for in terms of, at least in the past, George, you know, yes, we could lower blood pressure, but once people had CKD or heart failure, being able, HEFPEF, for example, this is dramatic progress. I mean, it's, it's really- So Christy, listen, here's where we are. 1980, we got nothing, no ACE inhibitors, nothing, losing 10 to 12 mLs per minute per year in GFR. Means if you now are diagnosed with diabetes today, in 10 to 12 years, you're on dialysis. Today, we've slowed things down, if you do everything right, to about two mLs per minute per year, which buys you that eight mLs per minute per year more time off dialysis, and hopefully by 2024, with the trial going on right now, the flow trial with GLP-1s, we may be able to slow it down even more. I don't know about normalizing, but, but it would be really dramatic if we could. And uh, before the SGLT2s, what I think the point you were making, specifically for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, yeah. it was zero. Yeah. They were all striking out. Although, I think spironolactone helps when you do a, yes. an analysis of the North American sites uh, in TopCat, right, they were right. beneficial. And my guess is is that the sprint study, the heart failure benefit there with intensive reduction, all oh, that was half pef I think. If you treat people's blood pressure yeah. who are not having heart failure yet, you can help prevent it. But you know, I'm impressed. That sprint analysis is not something that's really pushed up to the top, but there was a decrease in heart failure with intensive blood pressure reduction. Well, it was the, yes, but I, I think we, we ignore that as in terms of inexpensive ways. But so Bob, equally impressive was medical treatment for obesity. I mean, this has been, show some data this morning that was just, I mean, it's spectacular in terms of, when you think about our prior efforts, not having much success and having lots of side effects, uh, you know, why don't you share some of that data with them? Well, you know, a year ago in the late breaking clinical trials, I presented the high-dose semaglutide data at the 2.4 milligrams. and Also that, spectacular. It, it, it <laughs> is. And, and terzepatide now at uh, three doses, but particularly at 10, 50 milligrams, really has a major impact on body weight. Uh, a comparator study is never going to happen between those two drugs, but they're both very, very beneficial in terms of weight reduction that I think may compete with the decision to send a patient for metabolic surgery. Well, one of the pushes back that I hear from the surgeons is that this is something you're going to have to take lifelong. You think that's the case, or will a person be motivated once they've lost a significant amount of weight? Well, there's a substantial amount of literature from the surgeons that indicate that ultimately bariatric surgery is cost effective because the, and if they follow people long enough, they can prove that there's reduced costs for medical care. I think that's an argument that's going to continue. But ultimately, you know, Steve Nissen's been very interested, and in, I'm working with a, in a committee with this idea. We need a randomized controlled trial for bariatric surgery in terms of cardiovascular disease events. However, I think that trial can't be done without a medical comparator. And now we're looking at terzepatide or high-dose semaglutide is really the choice for a comparator. But will that ever be done? I, I, I don't so know. So I got to say the enthusiasm between SDL2s and also now with these agents, we finally set up a cardiometabolic clinic having an endocrinologist in cardiology. But in and, and, and some of the patients, I will say this, people who've been frustrated that once, once they start losing weight, they have been exercising more and they're, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me there's a certain success is motivating yes. and failure is demotivating. So I do think, Keith, that you're right that maybe you're going to have a lot of other things improving. And I, I don't know if that's all the weight loss, but if they're exercising and eating a better diet and, you know, more compliant with medications, obviously, but it's, it's spectacular, the changes in just a few years of our armamentarium. Now, Deepak, a big issue for clinicians is this, and I think we're seeing it more and more now, you know, the issue is is we have aspirin and then we have clopidogrel. Mm -hmm. uh, and it used to be that it was just aspirin. Right. You did publish data years ago that maybe it should be a clopidogrel. Yes. And, it, and, and some of it, it seems to be swinging back that at least in chronic therapy in high-risk individuals do we should be using aspirin or clopidogrel uh, and with a 
with a generic agent available, it's a bit, it's a bit, you know, it's it's another issue as compared to before when it was a branded. What are your thoughts? You presented some data today that was very interesting on that. Yeah, yeah, it's been an ongoing debate over years, actually decades. You know, the Lancet had published uh, the Capri trial. That's 25 years ago now. And uh, the host exam has come out, which is a trial in the contemporary era, East Asian population, but well done trial. I think the results should be generalizable to US patients, showing that in patients that received stents in a period of dual antiplatelet therapy, once that period of dual antiplatelet therapy was completed, they were randomized to either aspirin alone or clopidogrel alone. Uh, it's really aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitor. A and the, uh, that strategy of uh, clopidogrel uh, beat aspirin. Uh, in other studies, if we look more broadly at clopidogrel or ticagrelor, again, monotherapy with a P2Y12 inhibitor beats aspirin. Now, with ticagrelor, it's still branded, it, you know, it's expensive. It'll go generic in a couple of years, so there'll be yet another option among P2Y12 inhibitors. So I, I think we've got confirmatory studies. Yeah, it took a couple of decades sometimes to take science, you know, yeah, and no, medicine a while. Say, you didn't say, hey, I was right all along, guys. But, uh, <laughs> I implied but it, but I didn't were, say but it. you were. <laughs> so it takes a little while, but, you know, now the meta-analyses of the trials and everything are basically you know, consistent. I mean, clopidogrel is still more expensive than aspirin, even as a generic. You know, with aspirin, it's fractions of a penny a day. But still, I, I don't think generic clopidogrel is cost prohibitive but, but at this point. You mentioned also probably, in terms of using one month of dual antiplatelet versus a year, you're probably better off to, to go for the year. Sure, that was yeah. a separate trial. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's actually confusing. There's so much. It, at a distance, it seems like contradictory information in the antithrombotic world. In fact, it is contradictory at times. Not every trial lines up, you know, in the same. It's very different from LDL control, where basically everything's saying lower LDL is better, even lower is better than than sort of more medium degrees of control. Here, it's it, it's much more confusing. But the stop dap uh, uh, two ACS trial again out of East Asia. Uh, showed that uh, the 12 months of DAP was better than one month. It was meant to be a non-inferiority trial. I don't want to bog the audience down in the statistics, but the bottom line was uh, that the one month wasn't as good as the 12 month. Yes, there's less bleeding. Obviously, there's less bleeding if you use a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, but you double the MI risk by, by abbreviating uh, the duration of antiplatelet therapy in ACS patients. So, you know, stick with the guidelines for acute coronary syndromes, at least 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. Don't get distracted by all these trials saying shorten or other things for now, that remains the anchor. Now, Keith, you showed the data, you know, in, in real life practice, poor hypertension control. We say that we see the same thing in the field of lipids. And, you know, I've been asking a little bit, I talked to George Ford, you know, when I was a, an intern, we would start with HCTZ. We went 25 and then we went to 50 and then we went to 50 twice a day. And <laughs> nobody does anything crazy like that anymore. But in We've always said that you know, for, for lipids, you, get, you need to titrate all the way to the top dose before you do anything else. Yeah. I showed this pragmatic trial today uh, done in Korea, non-inferiority, but basically it came out what you'd expect is that you got, in terms of events, about the same, uh, slightly numerically better with a you know, low dose of Vesuva, uh, moderate dose, I mean, with a Zetamide versus a, a higher dose. Uh, but a little better LDL and a little better adherence, which is the same thing that we've done in blood yeah. pressure. We used to have big knockout, drag out fights about which drug was better than which drug, but the latest guidelines indicate that most middle-aged and older people are gonna need two or more drugs. So it makes sense to start with two medicines, either in one pill combination, but two separate pills, but two medicines at once. And in fact, I think there is now available a combination of resuvastatin and azetamide. That's, that's correct. And it makes really good sense to get patients to these more ambitious LDL goals. The average LDL in the United States is 113. That's too high. Once a person has had a high uh, risk calculation or they've had an event, have demonstrable disease, coronary artery calcium score greater than 100, it, that 100 goal is out the window. They need to be less than 70, and I actually like the pathway that says less than 55 in very high risk yeah, that's, patients. That's the new ACC, uh, as an expert. Uh, yeah, it's not a guideline, pathway. I said, yeah. Right, but I you know, it's, it's pragmatic. To work. We have new agents, we've got and glycerin and bimpedor guys are trying to show where they fit in. You know, Bob, uh, I know you, you were involved with Odyssey, but this issue about the, I like that analysis though, just this issue of who, or is it a high risk, and we have these different criteria, but if you discount the number of metabolic risk factors, I mean, I, you know, I thought, you know, you, that was an interesting sub, uh, uh, study analysis. 
Well, that's why we have this conference, cardiometabolic <laughs> health is what, what we'd like to emphasize, right? And, you know, it really makes us turn to both secondary and, and primary prevention. And I'm not sure which study you're referring you to. You know, just when they counted up at the one, two, or three, outcomes. the Odyssey oh, outcomes. Yeah, the Odyssey F for sure, yeah. Yeah, just, I mean, if you had three metabolic risk yeah. factors, they were the highest risk and they had the greatest benefit, absolute, and also a trend towards better relative risk reduction. You I know, mean, Christy, that relates to the theme of the keynote speaker today, therapeutic inertia, and we're talking about two drugs for blood pressure, maybe two drugs for lipids, and two drugs for diabetes. I mean, we're talking about getting people to go more quickly, and that's really something we're not doing well at. And if this audience has a take-home message from the conference, it's going to be getting something done on Monday that they didn't do last Monday. So, so this is fine, but I want to just build on this because this is not new, at least to us in the blood pressure field. The, the concept of combination therapy was pioneered back in the mid-90s, and Keith and I put it in the JNC7, okay, so it was in your face. It was carried over into the ACCAHA guideline, and the European guidelines have just trumped us and just said, hey, you just start here. Now, the problem is nobody's against combination therapy. The concept is the insurance companies won't pay for it for most of the time. They, they're, the stumbling blocks are not the physicians. It's not therapeutic inertia. It's the ability to do what you know is right. And so the concept, and I'll give you a beautiful example. I had a patient come in, a lawyer, who said she's not taking a lot of pills because uh, she's going to be sick. And so she doesn't want to be sick, so she's only going to take a limited number of pills. She needed four medications to get her blood pressure controlled. I gave her two pills. She was happy as a clam. Two different combinations that were complementary. Okay? Now, we're not teaching that in residency programs. Okay? This is the kind of thing I could get this woman treated if I had a combo lipid program. She'd be on three pills. We're done. Okay, as opposed to six. So I think that is the issue of, you know, combination pills. There's a, you know, non-statins. There's a combination of two different non-statins in a pill. Uh, well, you can even bump it up one level further. I mean, Keith mentioned the polypill trial, the secure trial. That's where, correct. You know, again, it was a huge win, right? It was lower cardiovascular death significantly so with that strategy. So I think it works in hypertension, the idea of combo meds. I think it works in... Uh, LDL control, and I think it works even more broadly in secondary prevention if right. we had such yep. an approach, because it improves adherence. Thank you. So yes, it's it's really uh, been a, it was a great morning. Uh, there is so much new data; it's always exciting. Uh, you know, what Ann talked about. Uh, I think the uh, the one of the thing that I think is this issue: continuous glucose monitoring. Oh, it's incredibly. I mean, that is really an exciting area in terms of. Uh, not only getting the information about how you change your medical therapies, but also about the lifestyle aspect of diabetes control. But I, I think uh, it's it's another area I think though that's really important in terms of both uh, the glycemic control, but also I think Bob, you want to comment about n nutrition because when people are wearing these, they see exactly the impact on exactly. what their exercise is, yep. what they're eating. Really important, and I think, you know, Anne's point was that we need to more commonly utilize this. She's carrying out this open-label trial now, but I think ultimately we could randomize that looking at initially A1C impacted various intervals, but I think beyond that, you could really make a case for a long-term trial looking at microangiopathy to follow. So, and, and one other very important theme, I think, for uh, all of us who are enthusiasts in this area is in addition to the individual treatments is looking at some of the social issues and social determinants of health. Uh, Ann talked about that. Keith, you've done a lot of work in this area. Yeah. I think if you look at the burden of chronic diseases, what we as clinicians do is really only about 20 percent. 80 percent of chronic diseases are related to the social determinants where people work, live, play, and pray. So we really need to address access to care, cost of medicines, having an identifiable source of primary care, appropriate referral to specialists and continuity and coordination of care. Patients oftentimes are given a primary care provider on the card from Medicaid or from a private insurer. They never see the person, they don't even know the person. May have seen them once, have no 
relationship to. So we need to coordinate care. We need to make sure that patients are part of the team. We talk about the team. We often say the physician, the nurse practitioner, the physician assistant, the pharmacist, the patient has to be part of that team. Well, I think related to that, there was the idea that to have an adequately informed patient does take time. Four-letter word, time, George. I mean, we need more time. And my clinic visits for return were 45 minutes because I absolutely insisted on it. Now, the clinic wasn't happy about that, but that's what I insisted on because even a return visit needs to be educated further about where we're at and where we're going. So, and I think other, you know, I know one of our faculty had a project where she's using community health workers who are being on a different, you know, Hispanic population. They were speaking Spanish. This is groups that were having difficult to affording medications. A lot of the big issues was there's just where can they get their medicines and how do they get their medicines filled when they're, you know, on Medicaid or things like that. It's not that easy for people to negotiate the system. We don't have any answers. Uh, at Tulane, we have a major NIH grant called Cherish. We're going to go into 42 churches. It's going to be a randomized cluster trial. One half of the churches are going to do what we do now. You go in, you give a lecture, some tear-off sheets, you know, check the blood pressure. Your blood pressure is high, call it a day. The other is we will use community health workers, mm -hmm. have nutritional classes, exercise classes, have patient navigators, help patients get to the physician, make sure they're taking their medicines to see if we can move the needle. It's going to be tough because these disparities, these mortality gaps are really baked into the healthcare delivery system. So it's not going to be easy to overcome. So in summary, very exciting in regards to the advances we've made in terms of new therapies, what we can do for our patients, uh, but also equally important, there's a lot of challenges and uh, we need to be the advocates for addressing these other issues. Uh, I think a lot of the people who are enthusiasts in this area uh, also have a voice that can make an impact in the community's key things that you were talking about. So we hope that you'll not only implement the things that you learned this morning into your patient practice, but also uh, speak up and try to help make the other changes. Thank you.